ferromagnetically below 14 Kelvin. When vanadium is put in, more vanadium lower the transition, which it seems nice that uh, the transition will be finally suppressed down to t equals zero. The problem of the previous work is that all the systems you are looking at are polycrystals. The samples are polycrystals. So sometimes the grain boundary issue for polycrystals will make the uh, results sometimes ambiguous to the study, especially for transport study. So my colleagues in uh, UC Davis, they were able to grow single crystals for many uh, samples ar across the whole series, and they construct a nice phase diagram by resistivity and magnetization. So you see this is temperature and this is uh, vanadium doping. On the left-hand side, the ferromagnetic order ends around 0.4 vanadium doping. On the vanadium-rich side, the magnetic ground state changes to anti-ferromagnet. So I'm interested to see if close to 0.4, whether we will have a ferromagnetic quantum critical point or not. So I measure specific heat. So this is the data, specific heat divided by temperature C over T versus log T. And you can see, so there are several compounds, and we don't have to look at into details, but most of them show a peak or a hump followed by a constant C over T at low temperatures. And let me explain what that means. If you look at the, uh, for example, Kittel's uh, condensed matter physics textbook, it will tell you at low temperatures, firm, uh, Landau theory describes the Fermi liquid behavior for metals. And that Fermi liquid behavior will result a constant C over T value at low temperatures. And that's exactly what you see. So all the data shows C over T being a constant at low temperatures, except for 0 0.4. So this is the 0 0.4 data. So to further look at the data, uh, we subtract the non-magnetic uh, reference out of this total specific heat. And this is the 4F electron contribution to a specific heat divided by temperature. And you can see for 0.4, it shows beautiful logarithmic divergence from 10 to 50 millikelvin. And this kind of behavior, usually we call it non fermi behavior. So the C over T is proportional to minus log T. That means when T is zero, C over T will be infinitely large. And that could be not explained by fermi behavior. And we don't know how to term it, so we just call it non fermi behavior. This is the first evidence that we might have a FMQCP. And because we have single crystals, we can work on electrical resistivity. Uh, so you there are four concentrations in zero field. This is the resistivity versus log T. Uh, let me tell you, for Fermi liquid behavior, it describes uh, after subtraction of the zero temperature residual resistivity, this amount of resistivity would be proportional to T squared. So at low temperature, we should have T squares for metals. And that's indeed the case for po 0, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3. For 0 0.4, that's not the case. So for 0 0.4, I plot over here. After the subtraction of rho naught, I plot log, log. And you see at the lowest temperature, the power, which is the slope in this plot, is just 1.2. So I have the 1.2 power, which is much smaller than two. And that's, again, the non fermi behavior. And if I apply high field, like a night Tesla, this is the resistivity versus T square. You can see at night Tesla, the data becomes linear. So that's the recovery of fermi behavior. So this slide shows you the second piece of evidence that I have, do have a FMQCP. When, I'm when the system is close to the quantum critical point, there will be only one energy scale, which is the quantum fluctuations of the order parameter. And assume people can write down the free energy for that quantum fluctuations, and we start to perturb the system by temperature and field, and smart people can write down the free energy in this form, and we just calculate the specific heat out of free energy, and also magnetization out of free energy. And it turns out, if this is right, 
No matter at what temperature, at what field, we measure specific heat or magnetization, all the data should be scaled in this way. So we plus C versus T to some power against field divided by temperature uh, to some power. So that power is the combination of some critical exponents. And those critical exponents have their own meanings. And they have pre been predicted by uh, theorists which describes the different classes of uh, quantum critical point. This is the data. I only show, I only work on the 0 0.4 from now on, and I measure specific heat sweep by, uh, with temperature in different field. And this is magnetization sweep uh, versus field measured in different temperatures. Exactly the same data, I plot them in a different way. And that's on the right hand side. You can see all this data collapse onto a universal curve. And from this, I can uh, derive some critical exponent and that I can learn better about the detail of the quantum phenomenon concrete point in this system. So this is the uh, first result. Now I want to show you the second result. So for the second result, I work on the nickel rhodium alloy. This is itinerant ferromagnet. So I guess most of you know iron, cobalt, nickel are ferromagnetic. If I take an intermetallic non-magnetic metal like a copper, palladium, rhodium, and etc., and I alloy it with nickel. So nickel orders around uh, 660 Kelvin at ambient pressure. The more M I put in, the lower the TC I would get. You should not be surprised of it. Um, people know this result more than half a century ago. And I work on nickel rhodium. So I measure magnetic stability and specific heat, some other measurements I will show you later. So this is a phase diagram. Uh, this is pure nickel and the TC could be suppressed quickly by rhodium doping. And I only focus on the black points around this area. And before I move on, so the trick should be similar. I will show you the specific data and you will see how the transition evolves when I have more rhodium doping. Unfortunately, this is an itinerant ferromagnet. So what's the difference between local moment system and the uh, itinerant magnet system? So for the previous compound, say at t equals to zero, it, at each side, they are really local moments, meaning, uh, let me use an, an arrow to re uh, represent the local moment. And they point to the same direction, that's ferromagnet. And let's elevate a temperature uh, a bit. You will see they start to fluctuate, but still net direction still point to the same direction. And when temperature is higher than TC in the paramagnetic state, moments point to different directions. So the sum would be zero. That's the local moment picture. If we look at the itinerant picture for usually for 3D electron, there is actually no local moment at all. And it's better described by wave phenomenon. But still, we follow these uh, uh, arrows uh, representation. Say, t equals zero, we have arrows point to the same direction. When t is finite, the, the length of these arrows shrink. But they still point to the same direction. And when <coughs> temperature is higher than Tc, the moment shrinks to zero. So there are no moments at all. And the problem, so there's a big difference between left and right. If you look, if you think about the entropy between here and this state, there is a huge entropy change from here to here. So that's why in specific heat we can see a transition. So specific heat props how much entropy is changed. But if you look at the right hand side, the entropy change from here to here is almost zero. So that's why usually in most of itinerant magnets, you can't use specific heat or magnetization to prop the magnetic order precisely. Then how do we know that our transition remains second order up to this point? So we use muon spin relaxation. 
we shine muons on the samples, and by measuring how muons decay, we can uh, get the data and calculate the important parameter, which is called 